episode of Outside the Rack is brought to you by Kinetic Performance, the makers of the Gym Aware. In today's world of strength and conditioning, data collections become the utmost of importance, and that's exactly where Gym Aware separates itself from the competition. Because when we're sitting there and looking to collect data, what data are you actually collecting? And are the numbers you're looking at fitting into the exercises that you're utilizing? And even more so, are they going to answer the questions that you're looking for? Looking at different ways that you are moving the barbell through peak and mean, both velocity and power, is really what separates gym aware from the competition. Being able to understand what your ballistic exercises are doing separate to what your strength exercises are doing really allows you to program at a much more specific level for your athletes. So hop on over to kinetic.com.au to see what Evan and his team have in store for you today. The world of strength and conditioning is filled with some fantastic practitioners that are always searching for more. But more what? What are strength and conditioning coaches searching for to better their ability to prepare their athletes? Well, what about cutting edge information or a place where you can find different opinions from forward thinking coaches on what you're doing, how you're doing, and try to get feedback to be better for your athletes? Or what about a place where you'll find like-minded coaches that can provide solid coaching advice and career development for you as you progress through your career as a strength and conditioning professional? Well, this is exactly why we built the Strength Coach Network. You'll have access to exclusive monthly content on top of the sensationally active forum that we have where you can communicate with coaches all over the world to find those answers that you're looking for to help you be a better practitioner for your athletes. So make sure you hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS, that's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS, and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the 33rd episode of Outside the Rack, brought to you by Kinetic Performance, the makers of Gym Aware. In this show, we're just going to try to dive a little deeper into some of the minds of the top practitioners in the world of sport performance to learn a little bit more about who they actually are and how they got to where they are today. Today, we are joined by the Dutch national volleyball team's head of S&C, Rhett Larson. Rhett, thanks for being with us, brother. Hey, Jay. It's great to be here. This is, uh, is going to be fun. This is a new kind of format. I, I really like this, and I, and I think it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. Dude, I'm actually super stoked for this. But before we dive too deep into this, who is Rhett Larson? Oh, um... Uh, aside from kind of the normal bio stuff, you already said I'm with the Dutch team. I've been with the Dutch team for about two years now, but before that I was in China. Uh, I think for a while I was kind of known as a China guy and I was there for seven and a half years. And possibly what makes me different than other coaches is that I am somebody that's gotten pretty married to the idea of working abroad. I'm super proud of course of being an American citizen, but I have come to realize that there are just so many wonderful advantages to the adventure of living and working in another country that I, I honestly, I, I get the occasional offer to come back to the States for some really cool jobs, but nothing sounds quite as exciting for me as working in another country and, you know, all of the little advantages that that can bring. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think I'm a coach that that likes that kind of thing. I think I'm a coach that, that my friends would say, I just, I don't take myself too seriously. I honestly don't take S and C too seriously. And I, I'm certainly attracted to those coaches like, or that are like-minded that also don't take at least, aren't very dogmatic in the way that they train that kind of understand that there is this, maybe this, illusion of history where where you at least in my opinion i think that when i think to the next five years how i might be training my athletes i think of all the things that i'm doing now that i love i think of like you said gym and wear velocity-based training i think of eccentric i think of my you know uh, accentuated eccentrics I, you know i think of these methodologies or modalities that I just, I feel like, of course I'm going to be using that in five, 10 years. But if I look back five or 10 years, I wasn't using either of those. And I was had a whole different thought. And so I'm very aware that the one kind of capital T truth in this profession is that everything changes, is that 
this too shall pass. And that whatever I feel really strongly about right now is there's a great chance that in five years, I don't feel very strongly about that anymore. And for just kind of a general principle, I don't believe in taking myself too seriously in that regard, that there's some other philosophies around, you know, around having fun that seem to make more sense to me uh, as a long-term philosophy than, than something, than any, any one modality. Boy, I think I went off the rails on that first one. I just no, <laughs> dude, that's rad because, like, Man. you know, that's you. Like, a, a dude who's having fun coaching people, traveling the world getting famous because of a warm-up, like, you know, like, it's oh, like, that's the thing. I knew you, know? you were going to bring that up. God, I, I, how did we not even, we not even the best thing in ever. our little free talk? All of a sudden, my palms start sweating instantly. <laughs> no, but that, I mean, that's that, great. But, like, when people would talk about it, I'd be, they'd be like, did you see that? I'm like, yeah, dude, that's great. Like, he's out there having a blast. The kids are having a blast. And, and they went out and won the match. Like, they, they were ready to rock and roll, dude. Who cares? Yeah, it it was very interesting when that dance video went so crazy viral for the that two week period. It was interesting to see the people and you know, the response was no joke, ninety-nine percent positive and wonderful. But it was really interesting interesting to see the few people that came out with this what I feel is like this super narrow minded view of how a warm up needs to be conducted. That that I mean I I feel like like, like, how can when when the only goal of warm up is to get athletes warm? I mean, it, 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 here's the thing. I just actually wrote the the next chapter for the high performance training for sports. I wrote the warm up chapter for it. They're coming out with the second edition, and I go on like a major rant in there that about how you know if, for everything that we all think has to be in a warm up, like whatever it is, foam rolling. There's also people out there that think that that's just a big placebo effect. That's a bunch of neurological little tricks that make you feel great, but actually doesn't do move the needle very much. There's similar people, there's similar studies that show that stretching is kind of a waste of time and, and all these things. You just have to get people warm. And it's just so funny to think that when it comes to increasing body temperature, how many people think there's only like seven ways you're allowed to do that and have it be a warm up that that deserves to be done with Olympic athletes. Dude, uh, and that's like so that's kind of the, the kind of ongoing of, joke, I, though, in basketball. It's like, yeah, we come out and we run this warm-up for 20 minutes, and then they go, sit down. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like yeah, who cares? Exactly. Just do what the kids is need that, to feel that, good. If, if you believe that your warm-up is so crucial and needs to be done a certain way, what are you doing for your athletes that sit on the bench for the first 30 minutes of a game before they get to put in? They, they get put in. You're absolutely right about that, Jay. Well said. No doubt. No doubt. I, I, just, I, I loved it. I, and I watched that, and I'm like, I couldn't get away with that. But I know for a fact that the one guy that could, and that that's wrecked. And I, you know, and I don't know any differently. Like it was, it was as surprising to me as anyone that that went viral. Like I don't realize people aren't, I mean, for me, that's just like one slight step uh, beyond like just regular neural activation drills that we've been doing forever that, you know, that we were, I was taught at Velocity Sports Performance when I worked at Exos, they had theirs, but it's all just, you know, they had forward, back, forward, back, left, right, twist, twist, this and that, side, side, you know, it's like, okay, well, what's the difference between that neurological challenge done quickly and like a, just, and it, the first time I did it, you just mix in one little bit of running man just to get a smile on the faces and then why not throw a couple more in? It's so, such a teeny bit of a, of an otherwise kind of pedestrian normal warm up that uh, to me is the secret sauce that makes kind of all the difference. It, it's well, in, in kind of adding value in a weird way, I feel like not enough coaches think about how you can become irreplaceable. There's a lot of coaches running a warm up the way you do. And you, and sure that particular brand might be specific to me or that partic that particular thing to do might be specific to my brand of warm up, what, what fits my personality. But there's certainly other things that other coaches can do that 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 just differentiate you a little bit. I mean, there's so much space for us to to, to be creative in this in this profession of ours. It, it astounds me that more people, a, don't try, and b, would even push back against when somebody else is doing it. I mean, I'm one of these guys that I hardly ever lash out against like internet gurus and 
punk ass new strength and conditioning coaches that dump, do dumb stuff on YouTube because occasionally I'll be like, oh shit, that's not, that's not that bad. <laughs> I think I can do a version of that that would actually work pretty well. <laughs> so anyway, like I said, don't, don't take life too seriously. Yeah, man. But you know what though, dude, like you've literally been in every corner of the world and you've worked at some of the highest levels that sport can be in. So there's been a lot of aha moments and I, I'm really excited for yeah. this one. Could you describe a learning situation that brought about an epiphany in your career? Oof. I, I was thinking of one before. Um, I'll tell you one that you just made me think of right when you said that, working in different corners of the world. I've had a few aha moments where I have met, I've gone to a new team, the Chinese team, the Dutch team, and I have met the who I think are the best athletes on that team and then have come to realize for the last 10 years, they've been doing what I consider a dumpster fire of a strength and conditioning routine. I mean, from the Chinese standpoint, you'll meet, you know, you'll meet girls that are the, that are currently the best on planet earth. And they, they do 10 by 10 squats, the same weight for the entire team. Uh, and then bench press as basically their only two exercises that they've ever done all their lives. That is an aha moment of stop thinking that you are so crucially important that you have to have things all one way. That for for me, who, like I said before, believes very, very passionately about the importance of velocity-based training and, and some of the other things that I do, just know that there are girls out there with, or athletes out there who do a completely different thing and achieve incredible feats of athleticism without my particular style. So this went to kind of fuel a little bit more of that, of that theory that I should spend less time defending till I'm blue in the face a way of training instead of trying to create an environment that, that gets the most compliance out of athletes that they want to come back that uh, is kind of a, a fun place to be. Um, I've, I think also other aha moments are, if we talk about the dancing thing, I can distinctly remember when I was a really young coach about 20 years ago, seeing my mentor work like a juggling station into his warm up. You know, the girls would do a set of jump rope, uh, an, a crawl across the thing, across to a wall, and then they got to spend one minute learning how to juggle sandbags. And I was like, well, why the hell? Well, it's because every girl talked about that for a week. And about how cool it was that they all learned to juggle, that he taught them in a 30 minute warm up a new kind of fun, silly skill. It had, you could argue that it was for, you know, a little hand eye coordination, but it's really no more than a party trick. But it's an essential party trick. It made him seem different than other coaches. That, that, and I, I definitely log that into long term memory that there's not just one way of doing this, that, that, that taking your favorite or, or, or what has been decided on is the most essential parts of a warm up, and then adding in a little something special every once in a while, be that a silly game, teaching them to juggle, uh, you know, a movement puzzle of some sort. That's the secret sauce that makes people want to have you in their lives. And so uh, I've run with that idea. That's for sure. I dig it, man. I dig it. You know, it's it's funny because I think that, you know, going back to some stuff we talked about off camera, like that whole idea that like athletes have been doing really well in spite of some things that have been done, like finding value in the people that you're around and being valuable to them may not be making them hit 0.75 right. meters per second on a clean pole. It might be something totally different. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, and and I know that that you've had other great coaches talk about this before, but I have certainly learned that allowing a girl, uh, allowing a girl to keep doing the four Bosu exercises that she thinks are essential for her knee health, even though me and the physio think that there are way better things she could do, allowing her to keep some of that in there is crucial to build buy-in and compliance, and it, at this level. You just got to know these girls have had either have ha have a really low training age and don't have much experience or have had some fantastic strength coaches in their past. You know, maybe I'm inheriting, you know, a girl that's been through your program that 
know that that if something works for them, everybody's freaking different. And my velocity-based training might not be as effective for her as her powerlifting that she did with Coach X. And so to be real humble is, uh, I think, important. No doubt. Well, listen, brother, this one I'm fired up for. Because, like, whenever we talk, we always walk away with more questions. Like you're definitely one of those guys that whenever I get to talk to you, it's like, man, like that was great. I got to go dig on some more stuff. So if Rhett could ask one question, he knows he's going to get the answer. What is that going to be and why? This is so loaded. Like there's no way I can be asking about like how strong is strong enough when I could be asking whether or not God exists. (laughs) <laughs> or why bad things happen to good people, right? Like <laughs> this feels like you know, this feels like if I'm just asking about the ideal macronutrient uh, ratios for losing weight, that's going to be a waste of a very, very important question. <laughs> you and I were talking. <clears throat> I, you know, here's what I'll say. I would say, and and, and this is going to be slightly topical, but I think the greater point will be made. I would, right now, I would love to know how much longer the coronavirus scare is going to be kicking the stock market in the nuts. So I am really, and and all right. So I say that because you know I I really I think investing something like in my older age, I think investing is so smart. I think. Too many coaches talk about how we don't need to, you know, that it's like a badge of honor to have toiled in the trenches for no money. And I think there's some coaches, I think Brett Bartholomew is doing a good job of kind of shining light on the this kind of, uh, I don't know, this old school way of thinking that you need to, to make no money in this profession, that that's necessarily a way to go. Um, when I say don't take yourself too seriously, the one caveat, I would say, unless you're negotiating your contract, and then you should act, you should absolutely be defending with cogent arguments how crucially important and vital you are to a team and its health and its culture. Uh, I mention, you know, the stock market because, you know, I'm somebody that freaking loves my job. I do. I just have so, I have so much fun doing it, but I don't want to be doing it when I'm 70. I don't want to be doing it when I'm 60. I, I abs- my friends all know that I'm a total nerd for stocks and investing, and I have been since I was in college. And I'm always imploring people to get into markets early because I, there's, a, there's a number that I need to have in my account where I know, hey, I don't need to take jobs anymore because I have to have a job. That's really important to me is, is working only because I want to work and it's fun. There's so much flexibility in our, in our profession. You know, right now I'm in a place where I only work in the summer. Like I have all winters off. It's so much fun. But to be able to have that freedom, I think you have to have prepared for it. And I don't know. If this is a podcast that I think a lot of young coaches listen to, I, I would really, really advise making sure that you're – putting money away so that you don't have to coach when you don't want to coach anymore. The biggest power that a coach can have is power over themselves. And if you've got money put mm-hmm. away and you don't have to worry about what bad things may happen, it makes coaching a hell of a lot more fun. Yeah. God, so much better said than mine. I mean, let's re-record it. I'm going to take your answer. <laughs> No, but I wouldn't but, have said no, that if you didn't ask that question. I'm like, where does he go with this? But and then, I like, think, you rolled it. That was I, rad, and, dude. And, you know, it's and the thing is, I think a lot of coaches aspire to work at a job like yours, you know, or maybe work at the Olympic level or something like that. But once you get higher and higher up with elite athletes, the stakes get higher and your ability to lose your job after one season increase exponentially. You want to have a super secure job, coach a high school, you know, like – you know, work at a big box, like private gym. But, uh, but yeah, so with, uh, you know, with the, the fun of being with an elite programs comes a little bit more risk that things could end abruptly. And I really think that, that you consider that when you're negotiating your contract to get more money. And you also consider putting it in a place that grows money instead of, instead of uh, just sitting in a, a savings account no doubt and yeah man shout out to brett for doing great things to try to help people understand that 
But listen, yep. brother, like again, you've been all over the world. You've coached the best of the best. And like, <laughs> you're always trying to get better. But what is Rhett's like primary escape? Mm. So on a, on the daily note, it's been crossword puzzles forever. I, I grin anytime I think about waking up, getting a, getting a cup of coffee and just doing nothing other than a crossword, even better when I'm back home here where I get actually a paper newspaper, because it's another, I can forget my phone exists for, for 10, 20, 30, whatever, how long that crossword puzzle takes. It is so, I think, I think as I get older, well, I think that as phones get more and more sticky and addicting, like those little things that take you away from it, and that one never fails. And I just love crossword puzzles. So that's that's a dorky one. The second escape that is another is an absolute happy place for me. This might sound crazy, but I love to freaking go bowling alone. And I like to just have an audiobook or podcasts in my ear. I want to bowl five games all by myself, maybe a pitcher of beer beside me. And I want to do I, that's another place. I'll totally forget about anything else. I will just zone out and and an hour and a half will fly by because, uh, yeah, bowling alley. I learned to bowl in China. I never bowled in the U.S. I became a bowling fan. I became I went I joined bowling leagues in China, of all places, like the most American sport on the planet. And I uh, yeah, I got good at it in China. That's rad. That's rad, dude. Yeah. Well, China, it makes sense because China, when you don't. You can't watch TV. Your TV doesn't speak your language. There's not that. You don't have social media because the Chinese firewall. Like when it comes to entertainment modules, I just happened to have an apartment that was walking distance from a 24-hour bowling alley. And it only cost like $6 a game. So you could just, or not even, it was like $4 a game because I would bowl at 6 in the morning if I woke up early. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. That's rad though, dude. I love that. That's awesome. But listen, Rhett, truly, as always, appreciate your time, man. Stoked to see you and glad you're doing awesome, brother. Yeah, absolutely. This was this was a blast. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, man. Well, cheers. We'll be in touch soon, bud. Yeah, sounds good.